My first run through of Three Houses was Crimson Flower, and while it's a great route, I just kind of stumbled around like a dumb little baby and did whatever Edelgard told me to do. After finishing Crimson Flower, I had a lot of questions about the lore of Fodlin and the Church of Saros, so when I heard there was a secret church route, I was pretty excited. But after finally finishing Silver Snow, I realized that most of my questions weren't fully answered. In fact, most of my questions remained unanswered until I finally got to the end of Claude's route, where Rhea explains all the lore that should have been covered in the church route in one monologue. I think the other routes contain really compelling stories, but Silver Snow's story just feels like a cheap knockoff of Verdant Winds. Alright, but it's possible to have a bad narrative and still fun gameplay. Silver Snow actually has a lot of unique content, including one chapter, and that's it. I think the biggest problem with this route's narrative is the cast. If you had heard there was going to be a church route, and you knew the main lord was not going to be any of these people, you'd assume it'd be Rhea, right? No, fuck you, you get Sedith. There's nothing inherently wrong with Sedith, but he was never designed to be a great main lord like Dimitri. Dimitri is a person who is constantly haunted by the people he's lost, and he makes a lot of regrettable decisions. But in the end, he learns to live with himself and fight for what he believes in. Sedith... Uh... Sedith is very content with the status quo. He has very few aspirations other than living happily with his daughter and serving Rhea. He's a perfectly fine character, he just isn't supposed to be a protagonist. However, we can't blame this all on Sedith, because the rest of the cast really doesn't fit well together either. The story should be focused on members of the Church of Saros, but because the pre-time skip is so focused on the Black Eagles class, it's sort of required that they be important in the post-time skip too? And here's an interesting challenge. Try and find any interesting connections between these two groups. Other than certain characters liking crests or fighting, I can't really come up with anything. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. In Chapter 18 of Verdant Wind, the Golden Deer are trying to find a way into Fort Merceus. As they were thinking of ideas, they make jokes about how Claude could disguise his Edelgard, they tease Ignatz, and then they pull off an elaborate plan with the Elmyrans. In Silver Snow, Sedith tells Byleth about the fort, and then in the next scene he says, Oh wow, Professor, that was a really good idea you came up with off-screen. Well, we're now in the fort, so we'd better get to defeating our enemies. You're so smart, Professor. It's still possible to have a good story with boring characters, but that isn't what happened here. Dimitri and Claude have crazily little importance. In fact, neither of them are seen alive after the time skip. Edelgard is your student for the first half of this route, so there's a lot of potential for her to become a great antagonist, but other than the cutscene where you fight her for no reason, Edelgard is treated the exact same way she is in Verdant Wind. Overall, you really don't even need to play this route in order to understand the overall story, because every unique bit of character development and lore is covered in other routes. The final level of Silver Snow gives you a bit of unique lore, but the lore it gives you is stupid. Really stupid. When I was playing Silver Snow, I had read a spoiler that Rhea would be the final boss again. I had a lot of problems with how the story had been progressing, but I still had a lot of faith in the ending. So many people in the Church of Saros treat her like a god, and I was really excited to see their beliefs challenged as they had to face the person they worshipped for so many years. But instead of that, this is what happened. Oh no, Professor, my evil disease is acting up again. I'm really a good person, but unfortunately I have an illness that turns me into a merciless killer. Professor, this pains me to say this but we need to kill Rhea. I know she has a sweet ass, but her evil disease leaves us with no choice. The game is trying to make you feel bad for Rhea, even though you barely got to interact with her since the time skip. While the final boss of Edelgard's and Dimitri's routes are part of bigger, emotional stories that are built up throughout the route, the final boss of Silver Snow comes out of nowhere. If you have an A support with Rhea, she manages to live assumedly because the developers wanted to give players the option for their self-insert to marry her? While it seems harmless, it totally negates any pity I may have felt for Rhea during her boss fight since she lives in the end. Rhea's evil disease is also never mentioned at any other point. Some people have theorized that Rhea follows the same evil dragon logic as other Fire Emblem games, 
but that still doesn't explain why Rhea would give all these people her blood, knowing they would turn into murderous beasts. Now into gameplay. To get into Crimson Flower, you need to have a C plus support with Edelgard, speak to her during a specific month and explore, and then protect her during Chapter 11. And if you want to get into Silver Snow, you just don't do any of the previous steps. The problem is there are definitely players who just didn't look at their supports or didn't speak to a specific character during a specific month, and now they're stuck in some shitty route. Also talking to Edelgard ends the explore early for some awful reason. Crimson Flower is the only route you can use Edelgard, Hubert, and Yuritsa. Azure Moon has Dimitri, Gilbert, and Dedu. Verdant Wind only has Claude, and as for Silver Snow... THERE'S NOTHING HERE! Despite there being a character who is so obviously important to the overall story, and playing as them would provide a player with a whole kit of interesting abilities, Silver Snow has zero unique characters. Sedith is supposed to be the main lord, but he not only is much weaker than the other lords, he is also missing out on a lot of unique combat arts, classes, and hero relics that usually come with being a lord. You unlock Sedith in chapter 12, and then the very next chapter, there's a section where you can only use Byleth and Sedith. This chapter can be fun with Claude or Dimitri, but with Sedith this map becomes a hellhole. All in all, Silver Snow is just a discount Verdant Wind. The chapters are almost identical, except they removed Claude and Nemesis, and in its place put in a dumb story about Rhea's evil disease. Okay, but it's not very hard to complain about something, so here's my solution. Just delete it. Okay, but that's a boring answer. Let's say we had enough time and money to really fix Silver Snow. I know unlimited resources isn't realistic, so I'm gonna reuse some maps, but I'll try to give a lot of unique changes to those maps. Alright, with that out of the way, my version of Silver Snow. First, I would want to eliminate the prerequisite of how to unlock Crimson Flower, making Edelgard's Coronation an optional cutscene and allowing the player to choose between Silver Snow and Crimson Flower without any headaches. There should also be a warning that the Explorer will end if you choose to view Edelgard's Coronation. There also needs to be some minor lore changes for my story to work. According to the wiki, Rhea's name was always Rhea, she briefly changes it to Saros during the War of Heroes, and then she goes back to being Rhea. First off, I can't find any evidence of this in-game, and second off, what? I want to make sure her name is always Saros. She changes it to Rhea after the War of Heroes, and in this version, Rhea blames herself for what happened to the Nabataeans, and she changes her identity in order to hide from her shame. And finally, I would want to make sure that the player knows who Cornelia is before the time skip. I know this seems random, but it'll make sense later. Chapter 13 is the first place I want to make major changes. First, I want to make Rhea the main protagonist instead of Sedith. In my opinion, there's a lot more depth to Rhea's character, and overall it's going to be a lot easier to make a better story with her as the lead. As a unit, Rhea will have high bases and mediocre growths. She joins in Chapter 13, but she's also going to be a required unit for the entirety of this run. Will her stats be broken? Absolutely! Considering she's a saint, a dragon, and the main protagonist of this route, in my opinion it would be a shame if she didn't have insane stats. Chapter 13 is a hell nightmare with just Byleth and Sedith, but with a Jagan like Rhea, this whole chapter could change for the better. I'd also like to change the story for this section a bit. The original has a scene where Edelgard and Byleth fight, but then they just decide to leave. In my version, Rhea would have never been captured during the invasion of Garagmok, but after losing the monastery and believing Byleth and Sothis to be dead, Rhea goes into hiding, trying to relieve herself of her shame. Years later, Edelgard returns to the monastery in order to keep her promise to the Black Eagles. Wanting revenge, Rhea follows Edelgard to the Goddess Tower where they duel. Edelgard uses a mirror and has a calm and focused fighting style. Rhea uses a bloody iron sword and fights like a crazed animal. Before Edelgard can deliver a fatal blow, Byleth intervenes. Edelgard feels she can still win this fight, but decides to retreat out of respect for her teacher. 
and his body. Rhea explains where she had been for the past few years and is relieved to see that Byleth Sothis. is still alive. She is furious that looters have taken over Garagamok and commands Byleth to assist her in dishing out divine punishment. Palarda will burn in the flames of eternal torment. After the battle, Rhea decides that it is time to reunite the Church of Saros. My only criticism of Chapter 14 is that it plays out the same way in three different routes. Devising a scheme to taunt the enemy and spring a trap is definitely a clog thing, but it makes less sense for Dimitri and Sedith. One idea I had is to change the gimmick of the chapter depending on the protagonist. For Silver Snow, we could have Randolph taunt Rhea, and in response, she summons a bunch of low-level green units that would act as a distraction for the enemy. Rhea isn't the kind of person to devise a devious scheme, but she is the kind of person to sacrifice as many lives as are necessary in order to reunite with her mother. I shall sacrifice as many lives as it takes! I think changing the gameplay of these chapters is a great way to make each route feel more unique. The only story change I would make to Chapter 15 is that the letter from Claude announces he wants to visit the monastery himself. Now we get into brand new shit. The next month starts with Claude, Judith, Dimitri, Gilbert, and Roderigue all arriving at the monastery. Claude explains now that Dimitri, Rhea, and Byleth have all come out of hiding, Fodlin finally has the momentum it needs to take down the Empire. Claude explains his plan to cross the Great Bridge of Murden and how he wants the Kingdom and the Church to march with them to Enbar. Roderigue and Gilbert advise their king to ignore this plan and to retake Fargus from Cornelia. But that plan doesn't really vibe with Dimitri's thought process so he decides to help out Claude. Rhea refuses to help, she believes the plan is far too dangerous, and while she won't reveal this to the audience quite yet, she fears that if she or Byleth were to fall in the battle, then she would lose her chance to reunite with her mother. Dimitri calls her a coward, and both he and Claude leave to go fight in the second battle of the Eagle and Lion. The battle of this chapter takes place on a night slash fog of war version of the ruins where Geralt dies. After realizing the Knights of Saros will not leave the monastery, those who slither in the dark send assassins to take care of Rhea. Your objective is to find Rhea and protect her from the assassins. At the end of the battle, Cornelia appears and seals away Rhea with the spell of Zaharas. Byleth faints. While Rhea is stuck in the darkness, an adult Sothis appears. Rhea tells her mother how lonely she has been, and how her mother needs to return and save Fodlan. Sothis tells her that the Nabataeans were created to defend Fodlan in her absence. While Sothis will never return to her mortal form, she believes that it was time for her daughter Saros to return and take Fodlan back. Rhea is returned to the real world and swears to take back her mother's home. In Chapter 17, Rhea tells us that she had hid something important in the Red Canyon while she was hiding. So the next map is a brand new one and takes place in an abandoned Nabataean temple. In it, Cornelia removes her human disguise and her usual army of the Titanists attack. After Cornelia is killed, Rhea announces that she is Saint Saros. Saros had blamed herself for not being able to protect the Nabataeans from those who slither in the dark and had changed her identity, hoping to escape her shame. Thanks to the words from her mother, Saros gains the confidence she needed to appear before the world once more. Call me Saros now. I am no longer the Archbishop, but rather a warrior. Saros then reveals what they had traveled to the Red Canyon for, the sword and shield of Saros, and an army of mechanical golems. Saros promotes from the Archbishop to Saint class, and Rhea's in-game name changes to Saros. Sedith and Flayne want a peaceful life after the war, so their identities remain a secret except to Byleth. So if we progress like the original Silver Snow, our next chapter would be the Great Bridge of Murden. But I never thought this made any sense, because Dimitri and Claude would have already captured this position on the way to Grander Field. We're also on track to have too many chapters now, so instead chapter 18 will be Fort Mercius, where Saros will use her new army of golems to help break down the walls. 
We would progress normally through the next few chapters as we go to invade the Empire in Shambhala. I think the potential for cool dialogue between Saros and the Agarthans is interesting enough that we don't have to make major story changes for these next few chapters. But we still need one more chapter to make it to 22. Now the final map of the original Silver Snow could actually work here, but I really do think we could find something more interesting. Let's think. Most of Saros' problems seem to stem from one event, that being the murder of the Nabataeans and her mother. But she already defeated the Agarthans, so is there anyone else she could fight? Alright, alright, hear me out. Claude's ending chapter is amazing, and Nemesis is such a great final boss, but it would be a lot cooler if Saros were fighting him. Claude is at least somewhat familiar with who Nemesis was, but Nemesis does not give a shit about Claude. Even in Claude's route, Nemesis doesn't ever shut up about getting revenge against Saros, and she's not even there. Saros, I will kill you! Nemesis and Saros hate each other. Hell, the first scene of this video game is the two of them beating the shit out of each other, and it ends by one of them stabbing the other, yelling, You took everything that I loved! Now Nemesis has returned from the dead, and will stop at nothing to get his revenge. These two were destined for a rematch, and it's such a shame that they never even saw each other during Claude's route. While Claude is a great stand-in for this fight, I think there are plenty of candidates that could make a better fit to be Claude's true enemy. I'd definitely love to make a new final level for Claude, but this video is already long as hell, so I can make a separate video on the topic if enough people are interested. My biggest problem with the gameplay of Silver Snow is that it has almost no content you can't get in other routes. We solved this by adding Rhea as a playable unit with personal classes and abilities, three unique chapters if you count giving Verd and Wind a different ending, and we could slightly improve the clone levels by changing some of the gimmicks. From a story perspective, Rhea has a lot more depth than Suburban Dad. While Sedith acts like a narrator and just explains the plot to you, a story revolving around Rhea can touch on a lot more interesting themes like revenge, the loss of a loved one, and dealing with failure. Now am I a writer? No. Do I know how game development works? No. I'm just some idiot who covered my Legos in ketchup earlier, so your opinions on Silver Snow are just as valid as mine. If you have something you'd like to share, let me know in the comments and I'll make sure to read it. Some future video ideas I have include fixing the other routes, unit analysis, and random bullshit, so subscribe if you're interested in any of those things. But honestly, I'm just thankful you made it this far into this long ass video. Alright, that's all. See ya.